In the previous presentation, we reviewed different types of quantitative research design. Now we need to collect data to feed the quantitative research design that we selected. In this presentation, I will cover the first step of data collection, which is sampling. So why do we need sampling? In an ideal world, we will collect information from all people that we are interested in. For example, if we want to understand ASU students, the population of our study will be all ASU students. Or if you want to know undergraduate students in the United States, your population will be all undergraduate students in the country. Would it be possible to collect information on all of them? How much time and resources would we need to do so? For those reasons, we will use sample, which is subset of your population and subject in your study. Thus, sample will be the people who are in your study, who you collect information from. What you eventually want to understand and make conclusions about is population. You observe things from your sample, then generalize your findings from the sample to your population. This is what I meant when I said a goal of quantitative research is to generalize the findings. Therefore, how you select your sample, which is sampling, is really important. And the sampling framework you choose will be based on how you can access to your potential sample. Sampling framework can be mainly two types. First is random sampling, and then the other is non-random or non-probability sampling. Random sampling, as the term speaks, is randomly choosing your sample from your population. The first is simple random sampling. Let's say you put everyone's name tag in a box and take out one tag at a time until you reach to your designed sample size. Of course, this process nowadays is done with computer. The second type of random sampling is a systematic sampling. You first list the people in your population and choose every kth individual. Like this picture, you can select second person first from the beginning of the number, then after that, select every third person from the previous number. On the other hand, strata sampling allows you to recognize different characteristics of people in your sample. First, you separate the population into non-overlapping groups called strata, such as male and female shown in this example, and then obtain a simple random sample from each group. In some cases, your population might consist of several groups. These subgroups are called cluster, and each cluster represents the population. Therefore, cluster sampling makes you first randomly choose the groups or clusters, for example, academic programs that consist of a university, then select individuals from each strata. So the four sampling frameworks we just reviewed randomly select sample. That means each individual in your population has the same probability to be chosen. Although random sampling is ideal, because if people are chosen randomly with equal chances of being in sample, then your sample will be most similar to the nature of your population. However, this is not always a handy option, and a lot of times people use non-random or non-probability sampling. This means that in your sampling process, not everyone has the same probability to be selected. First type is convenience sampling. Just as the name self explains, you draw your sample from part of the population that is close to your reach. For example, let's say you wanted to know how strongly Americans would support free tuition. So our population is all Americans, and drawing a random sample might be a very difficult task. In that case, you can draw your sample from people around you, 
your friends, colleagues from your work, your professor, and etc. Then, what do you think about using this approach in terms of generalizing the results? Well, as you see, the sample selected is rarely representative, and you have to acknowledge this when you use convenient sample. Second is snowball sampling. Basically, you use word of mouth. You find initial subjects and ask them to identify another potential subject who also meets the criteria of the research. For example, you wanted to understand work experience of female faculty on campus. You can contact five female professors across the campus and ask them to recommend their peers who are also female faculty on campus. Again, this frame might also suffer in terms of the representative of the population. Third type of non-random sampling is purposive sampling. When you have particular characteristics or dimensions of people that you believe as a good fit for the research compared to other individuals, you can purposely select people who qualify for that criterion. An example can be when a researcher wants to learn about first-generation college student. In this case, rather than randomly selecting sample from like any college students, the researcher purposefully would choose only first generation students. Finally, your population might be consists of people with different traits. If you want to have your sample to reflect the composition of population given those traits, you can assemble your sample to have the same proportions of individuals as the entire population with respect to known characteristics. Let's say you want to understand students' diversity experience on ASU campus. You will want to make your sample to reflect the racial ethnicity composition of ASU students. For example, if about 54% of the students are white, followed by 18.5% of Hispanic and 6.8% of Asian, and 4% of African American, you will want to make your sample composition similar to these numbers. So you will need to consider who your population is and how you will select your sample. When you consider sampling, you will need to consider why particular random or non-random methods we reviewed is better than other options. Again, random sampling might be beneficial for improving representativeness of the sample and generalizability of the findings to your population. But it involves a lot of time and costs. Sometimes to better reflect your population, you may need to purposefully choose non-random sampling methods. So the key takeaway is to choose a sampling frame that best serves your research purpose while trying to reduce potential bias and error due to the nature of your sample. Another important dimension for sampling is sample size. The sample size determines how generalizable the findings from the sample is. You can refer to sample size calculator that is available already. Or look at other studies to judge if you have enough sample size for a given population. You may want to go for a larger sample if your population is different in many dimensions and want to break down data into more categories and if you're concerned about a low response rate. Now you have basic concepts that are related to sampling. During our face-to-face -face meeting, we will discuss the choice of research design that fits to your research questions and workshop your sampling strategies. The following two videos will discuss how you can collect data from your sample. Also, I will cover how to frame your questions if you want to conduct a survey study. These activities will be also covered in the class, so watch those videos before you come to the class.